All set? Sorry, I'm late. That's all right. That's all right. Lindsay mentioned that the crypto space has changed a lot over the years. I stood up in front of you, I think it was this exact same room back in 2017, and, and tried to explain cryptocurrency uh, with all my might. And I thought I did an okay job. And then we hired Nick Selecki back in 2021, about a year ago, and I really realized I know nothing about crypto, and this guy knows a lot about crypto. So right now, I have the easy job. I'm gonna ask the questions. He's gonna give the answers. And normally, at this point, we tell you the title of our talk. I actually think this is a better slide to show you the title of the talk. And just believe it or not, when we put these sessions together, we don't put them together two weeks prior to the event. We spend the better part of a year planning it. And Nick, back in January, we, we, we spent a lot of time talking to clients, January, February, and in late 2021, talking to our clients about crypto. Not many clients are invested in it yet, but we certainly get a lot of questions. You can't miss the headlines. You can't miss the return numbers, depending on how you cut the data, your start date and your end date. But it's been on the minds of a lot of people. It comes up a lot. The original idea was we were going to kind of have just a, a kind of a general session on cryptocurrency and explain the ins and outs of it and some definitions. And then 2022 happened. To put some numbers around this, back in January, I'm going to pick on Bitcoin. That's really the poster child for cryptocurrency. Bitcoin was trading at about $48,000 per coin back in January. Now Bitcoin trades at about $19,000 per coin. So we have seen quite the drop. And we're here to, to not only explain why that has happened, but also some longer term, I'd say, indicators of interest on behalf of financial institutions. And just because we've seen such a drop in price doesn't mean that crypto is, the end is near. Or maybe it is. That's why we're here to answer the question, boom or bust. But first, I, I think it's helpful to spend some time talking about some general terminology. Again, I think some people have a, a decent knowledge of, of cryptocurrency and some of the terms that go with it. Others might not, and this is really going to be a, a much more engaging session if everyone's operating from at least some fundamental level of, of knowledge as it relates to terms. So we're going to play a little bit of ping pong right now where, Nick, I'm going to throw you the terms, you're going to throw the definitions back to me, back and forth we'll go. All right. And we're going to start with blockchain. So go, go ahead, give a, give a definition to blockchain for the whole group and then we'll take it from there. Real quick, thank you for having me. And for everybody here, uh, thank you for coming out. We realize your time is valuable and you could be anywhere, but you chose to be here. We're grateful for it, and I am jazzed to be able to talk about crypto with you. <laughs> so with that, blockchain, it's an intimidating word. It does not have to be. It is simply an accounting ledger shared across a network, and it's reconciled in real time. All right, well done. Cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency was the original buzzword for an aspiring asset class. Now it is one type of digital asset among many, and it's, um, now we call it crypto. And you just mentioned digital assets. So let me try to understand this. Every cryptocurrency is a digital asset. True statement. Yes. But every digital asset is not a cryptocurrency. Precisely. So maybe a broader definition of digital assets or some other things that includes besides cryptocurrency. So digital assets is sometime Mr. Market rebranded crypto. Digital assets is a more specific term. The reason was cryptocurrency was cool in 2012, but it isn't exactly accurate of the market today. Since 2012, there's been over 8,000 coins, networks, and applications that have come about, and cryptocurrency only captures one facet of it. So digital assets refer to any asset on the blockchain, and those assets can be used, one, as an incentive for other people to participate in that network, but then also as the unit of account. Okay, and the last, the two-for-one special, FinTech and DeFi. FinTech is financial technology. Uh, this word came from Silicon Valley, starting to dedicate their brain power and their resources towards innovating capital markets. The intent is to do with capital markets and money what the internet did with data. DeFi is decentralized finance, and that stands in contrast to centralized finance. If you think like a bank now, one entity tends to control the accounts, the assets, and they handle everything through there. As this lattice above me shows, decentralized finance doesn't have one single entity in charge. There's a number of players, and no one thing can sway the network. All right, now I want to connect the dots a little bit here. Let's circle back to blockchain. W why is blockchain important to, to all these applications, crypto, digital assets, DeFi, or, or perhaps just more succinctly, how does blockchain connect all these other definitions? So the blockchain is like software, and at its core, it manages risk. It solves for risk. You know, in 2008, uh, there was a trust issue in the market. Um, and blockchain or Bitcoin first was put forth as a solution for that. For a transaction or transfer to happen, the, everything has to balance. And if it doesn't balance, it simply doesn't happen. So with that, 
any institution or entity or person could trade or transfer assets to another, and that issue of risk or bouncing a check was eliminated. And then, then not to belabor this slide, but a true-false question for you. Any specific cryptocurrency, again, let's pick on Bitcoin, because that's probably the most well-known, was invented primarily to be traded. It was not. It was originally put forth as a payment network, plain and simple. Uh, speculation in secondary markets didn't really become a very prominent thing for another two years. And now, it's a whole other story. Speaking of a story, let's talk about what's happened this year in the crypto market. I think the numbers on this chart are staggering. The market peaked in third quarter of 2021 at almost $3 trillion. Within six months, it shed two-thirds of its value to be under a trillion dollars as a total market. We've talked at a broad level some of the macro factors and the broad sell-off in the equity market, and really, I, I think you could argue the end of speculation in, in some ways, but I think there are a lot of idiosyncratic factors or explanations in the crypto market, so there are a lot on here. Maybe highlight a couple that you think are the most important to, to share with the group. All right, so crypto is going through what some pundits have called its dot-com or its 2008 moment, and it has aspects of both. The recent drawdown's been driven primarily by a sentiment shift, disruptive individual events, and deleveragings. Uh, starting with sentiment, no surprise, as inflation and recession concerns started to mount, crypto was at front and center for an asset sell-off that began around November of last year and has been continuing for the last 10 months. Uh, with that, there's been individual disruptive events. One example being a hack of $650 million on the Ronin network, and I believe that was around April or March of this year. And what happened with that was the funds were stolen, and the headlines hit the news. It further reinforced negative sentiment. It made some people skittish, they sold their, their assets, and it drove prices down further. With that, the funds were returned, but that damage can't be undone. Additionally, a few, uh, few months later, there was the Terra Luna network. You may have seen it in the news, even if you didn't know what it was, it was a stable coin, keyword was. Uh, it was a pegged currency, and what that means you could get one Luna for every one dollar. And as uh, it experienced a hack, it broke its peg. If $40 billion evaporated in a span of days, and that was the catalyst for a larger sell-off, and the value of it is debatable. It could be anywhere from 100 billion to 400, depending who you ask. The last one is leverage. It's present in every market, and crypto is no exception. Um, leverage in derivative markets like futures, that's pretty common in crypto. A lot of these small dips are accredited in part to that. It's a perpetual force. But what's more impactful is the direct markets where you can buy crypto on margin, whether you're a retail or institutional investor. Globally, some, ex some exchanges allow for margin ratios of 10 to 1. There was one that allowed 100 to 1, and it didn't last very long. And with that, as all of these market values have risen and fallen, people that were levered face margin calls. And after the first wave of margin calls, the prices reconciled, went even lower, and another round came through, and it turned into this cascading liquidation event similar to a snowball rolling down a hill. And that's how we got here. Now, normally, when we talk about this large loss of capital, such steep price declines, you don't see a lot of money running into the market. You see people running out of the market. And I, certainly, from an investment perspective, people have bailed on the market. But what you're seeing is a lot of large institutions, whether that be venture capital firms, hedge funds to a degree, asset managers, banks, actually investing in the infrastructure and really enhancing their ability to offer products and trade in the space. So we have a couple of charts that highlight this. This really gets at the numbers that you're seeing. But if you look at this page, Nick, what jumps off the page of you? So when I came to the market, well, since I came to the market before that, since 2012, Bitcoin and digital assets broadly have been declared dead uh, 466 times, 22 times this year. Um, it's a way of saying we've been here before. These drawdowns happen. Yet despite that, um, as, as skeptics come out of the woodwork screaming vindication and with a lot of sand speculation, um, it would seem that if crypto was a speculative asset class that they're in good company. And the reason is primary market development has only been accelerating, it's been continuing. Uh, Sequoia, a prominent VC firm out of Silicon Valley is no surprise. VC firms tend to be at the front of technology and they have been for about the last two decades or most of my life. Uh, with BlackRock, they've been across headlines recently with a number of announcements with Aladdin and Bitcoin. Um, but beyond that, a number of institutions have been investing in the space continuously um, and it's been largely unnoticed. The one that surprised me the most, and I'll be candid, is Berkshire. I think many people have seen some of the quotes on the news or just some of the commentary in the markets, and to see that they were investing in exchanges and uh, fintech custody solutions outside of the US, for me, it may be do a double take. 
And I think this next slide really brings the previous chart to life a little bit, because you actually see the logos of these names, and there are a lot of really familiar names. What may, may be a bit less familiar is the partnerships being formed. So you have these large institutions, again, which are well known to most people in, in the investing world, but they're partnering with more nuanced shops which have expertise in crypto or in blockchain or just in one aspect of this. Take us through that and what that really means for the future of, of really crypto and the ability to trade and invest in crypto. All right. So a number of firms have been investing through their VC arms, or if they're not a VC firm, they have an affiliate. Others have been using proprietary capital, and some have gone it alone. They have the resources and the ability to do so. And over the last few years, you can see names like JP Morgan, they've been developing their Onyx network. But one trend that has risen above the rest is partnerships. You have a lot of traditional firms where they have the resources, they have the brand power, they have the licenses, but they don't have the technical savvy. And then you, there's a number of fintechs, these tech companies coming in, where they have the technical savvy, but no one knows the name, or they don't have that credibility yet. And it's like a match made in heaven. The market is ripe with partnerships and joint ventures. Uh, JP Morgan was working with the Ethereum Enterprise Ethereum Alliance and the Ethereum Foundation to help develop their wholesale network. Um, after that, Standard & Poor's partnered with Securitize to bring some of their solutions to market. Uh, one that propped out recently was BlackRock and Coinbase. You know, working, we have one of the largest asset managers on earth, if not the, working with Coinbase, the IPO and public custody solution for crypto in the US. And that was a prominent match. Uh, one that was really interesting globally that uh, it wasn't in a lot of publications was JP Morgan and DBS partnering with the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Singapore, the government has been very forward in trying to create a crypto ecosystem responsibly and making sure all the stakeholders are involved. And what they're looking to do is have these entities explore decentralized finance and tokenizing assets and bringing it to market. One of the questions we get a lot when we, when we do these, these meetings with clients is, what's the long-term vitality of crypto? Is this a flash in the pan? Is this just the next hot investment thesis that's dead in a couple years, or does it have staying power? And we can't ultimately answer that question right now, but certainly I think the investments we're talking about here, the names you see on this screen, certainly are supportive of the longer term thesis of, of crypto in, in some way or another. But at the same time, it feels a little bit late. And let's circle back to, you mentioned Sequoia in the venture capital world. We're all too familiar with the, Google, the, the success stories of Google um, and Uber, right, on, the, on behalf of VC firms. But this is something they've been doing for a while now, or 10 years into it or so, across the, the venture space. So talk a little bit more about that trend, the run-up you saw, especially in 2021, and a little about kind of which segments there's the most activity in. So VC offers probably the longest time horizon that we can assess the space with some transparency. You know, those, those numbers have been out there, but it hasn't, asked, hasn't been an asset class that everyone's looked at for a number of reasons. Um, more important than the deals on the screen or the dollar values associated with them, VC gives us insight into where does Mr. Market see value or utility? Where, is, where are the applications beyond secondary speculation? And as this radar chart above me shows, it starts with payments. Payments was the first well, real application that blockchain and crypto was put forth to solve, and that's still continuing. While Bitcoin and its economics may not work ideally as a payment network, there are a number of coins that are, they're scaled, and they're actually transferring money in real time globally. Um, two other sections on here, alternative lending and consumer finance. This is a nice way of saying DeFi, but it also can be centralized finance. And that's simply taking everything you know from banking, online banking, and capturing the efficiencies of time and cost. The one that's, I will say digital assets blew me away. I had thought it, but it's nice to see, you know, that, that little I got it moment. Um, a number of firms have been investing in the infrastructure and custody solutions of digital assets, primarily because they're developing the primary markets and they need to be able to hold it. But also, they realize that if they're staying power, if these applications come to market and really innovate the world, there is the chance that assets could appreciate in value, and they want to be able to capture that for themselves and also their clients. Now, what I'm about to share with you will probably be the least surprising slide you'll see all day today, and that's when there are attractive investment returns to be talked about. People are interested in investing in a certain asset class or strategy. Financial firms are more than happy to develop a wide suite of products which will suit every single investor's risk and return tolerance. Crypto is no different. The only perhaps exception is how quickly these have all popped onto the marketplace. Nick, there are four categories here. Maybe take us through all four of them. So as you can tell, I'm healthily obsessed with crypto. But by day, I work with asset allocations and help your consultants with portfolios. Um, on the, with that, I know that every investor in every portfolio is sensitive to risk, liquidity, everyone's individual, and they have needs they need to meet or constraints. 
What I wanted to capture here on the far side, with starting with the spot markets, is that this is some of the more liquid ways people have started to move into the space and get exposure. Um, beneath that are the equity-based blockchain ETFs. Not everybody can hold crypto, and it's not right for everybody. So as one way that institutions have found access to this broader space that plays within their current limits. On the other side, above me, we have the spot private funds. To date, the SEC has not approved a spot ETF in the US. Um, globally, there are several, but trusts are the best thing we have to work with similar to an ETF here in the States, similar to an open or closed real estate fund. They're structured very similarly. Um, and with that, there's been a number of flavors rising. Some people see Bitcoin's volatility and they gasp. So risk managed funds similar to defensive equity or low volatility vehicles, they've come on the market and they've had some staying power. The last one on there is, as we've hit a few times, is VC and hedge funds. It's not for everybody, but if you don't have, uh, if you can manage a lockup or a longer time horizon, that is another avenue that could be explored. So, over the last 10 years, as I've had conversations with family, friends, investors, uh, clients, two big statements usually stand out or come up at some point. The first being Nick we don't invest in individual assets. We buy a diversified basket. I know it's a profound concept. Um, the other one, and it's my personal favorite, is when a family member said to me, Nick, I think you and Bitcoin are stupid, but blockchain has potential. And after years of crying in therapy, I made some charts to really shed some light on this. On the left, we have return and risk. And Bitcoin is your purple uh, circle. The crosshairs walk you onto it. And you can see how some of these other vehicles, like the blockchain ETF, stack up. The question I wanted to answer was, do they actually capture the essence? If someone found the risk return profile of Bitcoin appealing, do they hit it? On the flip side of that was, what did they do? I didn't know. So looking at the upside and downside capture in these markets, you can see something like the risk managed profile. Yes, it does capture that upside appeal. However, if someone buys this expecting the return profiles of an equity portfolio, they're going to be surprised. Also, if someone buys something like the first trust ETF, expecting it to follow and track Bitcoin, they're going to be underwhelmed. We talked about the drop in price across crypto. Yet we've talked about the investment of financial firms and, and I'd say that's supportive of the longer term thesis of crypto. But ultimately, we're here to answer the question. Nick, as you look at cryptocurrency, given what's happened in 2022, given some of the other information we shared, is it a boom or bust? So. Despite what I want to say, I have to pro approach the space objectively, and that requires recognizing it as it is, no better and no worse. It appears that risk assets are out of fashion, and I don't see that changing until there's a positive shift in sentiment. Um, as I look at the institutions coming into the space, the capital being deployed, uh, it appears there's, the space could be maturing. And when we look at how low some of the market values are, I can understand where investors may see an opportunity. To that note, if any investor ever wants to consider or thinks about any asset class, especially blockchain or crypto, uh, it's important that they take a disciplined, risk-aware, long-term approach. And due diligence is key. But I will answer your question. I've dodged it long enough. And I'm going to borrow your old analogy of the crypto ballgame. It is in its early innings. And it is down a lot. <laughs> but it's not out. There's a lot of game left to be played. So time will tell. And we're going to land there. There's nothing I can say that's going to add any value to, to what you've said. I think you wrapped it up really well. So we'll stop there.